All right, good morning, everybody. How is everybody out there today? Hope everybody's doing well and having a good week. Ready for the, some weekend shenanigans, maybe? Or some at-home weekend shenanigans? <laughs> um, some quick updates to start off and everything like that. Um, today, we've got a special two talks. Uh, we've got uh, Karen's going to be giving another talk about mantas um, in Spanish at 12 p.m., like so a little bit after we finish up with this one. Then tomorrow, I'm going to be switching chairs to tell you a little bit of a special story. It's kind of the story how all this came to be, Dive Ninjas, Ocean Stories, and all that. We're going to take a little journey through the last few years of adventures and conservation projects that myself and Dive Ninjas have been working on. Um, as well as look at kind of how ecotourism can do incredible things and how you can help save the ocean just by choosing to turn your vacations into awesome ecotours instead of normal tours. Um, then right after that, we're going to jump into a special Patty Project Aware Coral Reef Conservation course um, for those that might want to learn a little bit more about coral or um, how they can protect them. There's only a few spots left, so make sure to sign up as quick as you can. Um, the course will run about three hours or so, and it actually includes a PADI certification, which and all that kind of stuff too. Um, so let me introduce you to a very incredible human we have joining us today. How are you today, Karen? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for the invitation, Jay. Oh, it's awesome to have you. Thanks for taking the time out to be with us and teach us about mantas. So Karen is the founder of Manta Mexico Caribbean Project. Um, she's been working with mantas in the Mexican Caribbean for quite a while now, since uh, 2012, 2013. Um, and she works alongside Manta Trust and some great organizations and everything like that. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you. Let me stop sharing my screen and pass it over to you. Thank you so much. OK. OK. So thank you everyone to be able to connect today. Oh, it's there is a potential thing, question thing. Okay, can you see it properly, Jay, there? No, not yet. Uh, there, you gotta put it up, the screen share. Wait, wait, oh. Mm, one second. There we go, now we, we can see Yes? Screen. Yep. Okie dokie. Perfect, all to you. Yes, thank you. So thank you everyone that uh, it's today trying to to take some time off from <laughs> from the global situation. And I'm very happy to be able to talk about our favorite species of the planet from our organization, which are the manta rays. Uh, we started this project in 2013, and formerly a legal nonprofit under Mexican law in 2000. 14 or 15, okay, yeah, some years ago. So this, uh, this organization has been the result of collaboration of many, 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 many people. And some of the organizations that we work along because manta rays are not only manta rays themselves, we need to protect also other ecosystems like mangroves and reefs and uh, to address other type of uh, problems that manta rays can be facing, like for example, marine pollution, etc. So I would like to take you to a journey during this talk. I will try to be as precise as I can. It's a long, it, there is a lot of information that I would like to share with everyone, but if we're short of time, we can always keep in contact in, by email or something, so you can always contact me. So the Monte Caribbean project, it's, uh, I like to call it uh, impact, for an impact organization, uh, why? Because we don't get money from what we do, but we, it's, it's behind of what we need. We, we need. we don't need the money specifically, we need people that care, people that are committed to the ocean and conservation. So as I already explained, like we have different collaboration, we different collaborators during this, uh, this journey. So we have people that collaborate with us as the Manta Trust for the scientific approach, a conservation for the local community and education, we also work with the local community. This is very important for us because science is essential to address specific problems that oceans are facing. Um, we need a science to provide tools to, to change policy and to provide sources for management and a, well, 
as you can see here, there is a bunch of people that I have been so lucky to work with along, and they still working with us. Uh, we are the Manta family all around the world, uh, Manta Trust Projects. We are now 25 uh, global uh, organizations working towards the conservation and, and science for this amazing species. So I would like to introduce you where we are located. So many people uh, know where is Yucatan's Peninsula. So Yucatan's Peninsula are three states of Mexico, Campeche, Quintana Roo, and Yucatan. And we are um, based, this is Manta House, as you can see the Manta House is there. So this little island is called Isla Mujeres, and this is where our research uh, station it's located. Uh, I live there and uh, the team, the Manta team, come, the Manta team comes every time we have to, to, to work uh, for research purposes or conservation activities. So the first question that we get a lot is like, okay, manta rays, are those the ones that kill Steve Irwin? Are we gonna die? No, manta rays are not uh, responsible of what happened with this uh, biology, but it happened. It's like there is many, many different species of rays. Uh, manta rays are a uh, relatives of sharks, and uh, manta rays and devil rays are considered mobulid rays, which I will explain to you a little bit later. But this uh, slide, I really like it because it's like manta rays have been a uh, like a blame on all of the situation with Steve Irwin and they're not, they don't even have sting, they don't, uh, they don't attack humans or anything. So I, I thought that this could be like cool to show you. So this is one of the, of the videos taken in the Mexican Caribbean. So uh, taken by my uh, Manta buddy and Dr. Annie Morey, which is my right hand and project manager of our project in the Mexican Caribbean. So as you can see here, you can see two different species of mobulid rates, okay? So mobulid rates are related in some way with a uh, cow nose, a uh, race and eagle race, but those rays still need the seabed to keep a uh, you know living because they feed from the seabed in the case of manta rays and devil rays they develop uh, uh, there's the strategies uh, evolutionary uh, are one step forward so that means they adapt to pelagic areas they have these like uh, diamond shaped bodies as you can see they feed from plankton by all of the species of mobile rays so currently there is like a 10 species of mobile rays. This is the hypostoma that we call it. The, this is one of the pygmy, uh, West Atlantic pygmy devil ray. And then we have our uh, friend on the back, which is the Caribbean manta ray. I will explain you a little bit more about this beauty. Uh, but with this video, you can see, uh, well, pretty much the amazing nature we can encounter in the Mexican Caribbean. Uh, one of our our challenges that we face uh, doing research where we are is that the, the study area is huge. We currently work at four different marine protected areas, which are the most famous ones probably for people that have been in Yucatan's Peninsula is the Welsh Shark Biosphere Reserve and the Mexican Caribbean Biosphere Reserve. But we also work in, uh, in a national park that is called Isla Contoy and Jumbalam, uh, which is another a protection area for for nature right so um, a lot of a lot of research needs to be done between 10 and 15 and even 20 miles of shore so for us it can be challenging to to find these uh, these pelagic species like manta rays so this is one of the tools that we are currently uh, using to to try to find them uh, this is a, a project thanks to Carl Booker and the manta trust who are a helping us with uh, the funding of this of these aerial surveys. As I told you, these huge marine areas to protect are, it's so big. So we cannot just cover by boat. We are starting this research project last year. So hopefully in a couple of months, well, maybe in a couple, maybe next year, we will be able to, to, to keep uh, working on this. So as you can see here on the right, I don't know, yes. Okay, you can see that's the transect that we are currently uh, covering. Uh, it's the same transect that other people like well shark researchers are using because uh, this, this can be like the, 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 the initial phase of the project. So then we can see if they're manta rays or not, or they're not manta rays. We normally fly at 500 meters 
high, so it's not much. So we are able to see manta rays. Manta rays are big, so we are able to see them. Uh, we collaborate also with uh, the uh, national government in the area, which is the National Commission of Natural Protected Areas, CONAM, for people that are very uh, familiarized with this organization. They are the ones that are in charge of um, managing all activities within marine protected areas. So all our work is within marine protected areas since 2013. So this helped us to, to create um, um, a very important relationship with the government in order to provide tools that can help for future uh, management measurements that are related with the, with, the, with the devil rays or manta rays. Okay, so another thing that we have been doing for years is the, is the community collaboration. Uh, I started working with whale sharks in 2010, I think, or something like that. I don't even remember. My memory is not very good. Uh, and uh, anyway, I think that community is a huge part of conservation and science at this point, right? Like researchers uh, can be uh, doing a lot of work, a, a very essential work, but if we don't integrate community, uh, it's going to be a, a, a bigger challenge to overcome the, the, the pressures of the oceans, including fishing or illegal fishing or other <clears throat> other topics. Um, I really like to, to work with fishermen, captains and deckhands and the local tour guides because that's the way we can spread out knowledge about manta rays and also they are the eyes of in the ocean when we are not able to be in the ocean because sometimes the lack of funding doesn't allow us to be there all the time so we are we have them that i mean i don't know anyone that doesn't love manta rays manta rays are so elegant and so beautiful and so big but at the same time so vulnerable right so i think that it's very important to focus on on how we can uh, put together efforts with the local community because in comparison with other regions in the world and in mexico uh, the tourism industry is very well known in our region because of the well shared tourism right and other other activities etc so then this 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 helps us a lot in, in a conservation way to address other topics. So I'm very happy uh, that, uh, that to see the new generations. When I start working in this region, the, the captains nowadays, they're used to be the deckhands that I used to, to work with. So it's amazing. It has been a, 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 a super amazing human experience to see how generations can change and can improve uh, conservation, right? So uh, let's start a little bit. I will like to be very general with mobiliths because there is a lot of things going on uh, related with taxonomy and everything. So, so and there are a lot of things that I would like to talk about, but I will try to be as specific as possible. As I already said, mobilids rays are uh, all of these 10 species and probably uh, another manta, the manta ray that we have in the Caribbean. So this Caribbean manta has a uh, like a mix of features like morphology features between the virus trees or oceanic manta or reef manta or alfredi manta that is a, the scientific name right so uh, all mobile rates are a uh, plankton feeders uh, some of the devil rays can uh, feed from small fish and um, the size uh, it depends on the species. I would like to recommend you a very good book and guide where you can actually study these amazing animals by, by a more, a, with more detail. So <clears throat> here I would like to be very specific about the difference between mantas and devil rays because many people are like, oh yeah, I saw a manta ray and then it's a stingray or then it's a devil ray, right? So manta rays, um, devil rays are from the same uh, gender, okay? So then we, we have the mobulid group, okay? So as you can see, the mantas have uh, the mouth position. It's like, as you can see, it's in the front. Um, the, the cephalic fins that we have in the front, those help them to, to, to give direction to the plankton while they are swimming, okay? So this picture, as you can see, the, the upper part, you can see how it looks like like spoons, right? They're longer and they're very, very uh, longer than the devil ray ones and the mouth is wide open. So then, <clears throat> sorry for my throat. And then here we have the devil ray. So I think it's very clear. If not, it, you can ju just have to uh, uh, 
exercise your eye because uh, it can be complex and even uh, it took me years to to see the difference and I still with the devil rays can be difficult okay and you can see how the the fins the cephalic uh, fins are shorter the size of this devil ray it's shorter this one is the one that we can see in the Caribbean but you in Baja for example you have other species which is the mobular the Mukiana and Turstani if I'm not wrong so I will I will talk about that later um, you you can see how the mouth, the mouth is positioned in another, a little bit lower, okay? So then those are the main features between mantas and devil rays, the size, the mouth position, and the, the, the cephalic lobes, okay, which are these fins on the front. Okay, so here is another example. That's why it can be complicated, right? So on the, on the above we have uh, the devil ray, and then we have the manta ray underneath, but this is very clear, so that's why I wanted to give this image just one slide for this one. And uh, you have a, a friend there, the remora ray. Uh, the remora always uh, getting stuck in the manta rays or devil rays. Okay, so manta rays. Uh, there is like uh, two described species in 2009: uh, the reef uh, resin manta ray and oceanic manta ray. As you can see. Some people see uh, they look the same, but scientists have differentiated these uh, these two species with specific features. Like you can see in the reef manta, there is like a Y on the on the shoulders in the patches. It's, it looks more like a Y, and then on the oceanic manta or or virostris, you can see more like a T. Okay, so these kind of features you will learn to. To, to, to understand how does it work with the, with the colorations and everything. This can be tricky. So if you're really passionate about manta rays, I will, I will uh, recommend you where you can study and where you can learn from memory specific features from the different species for, to different, differentiate the, the species, okay? So then another very characteristic um, thing about the reef mantas is the, the on their bellies. Each manta ray have their own ID identification like us with our fingerprints. Okay, so that's the way you can, uh, you can, you can identify the reef manta has the, the, the spots between the gills and around the belly, okay, uh, in between the gills. Then we have the barostris or oceanic manta ray which has them underneath the gill slits. So you can see, and you can see also the patches of the coloration of the uh, underneath a uh, wing you can see how it's darker so these kind of features were understood after so many years that uh, that scientists have been studying manta rays uh, <clears throat> and as well one of the other features is like where do they live like it, it's it's known that reef manta rays are more uh, freaking found in, in in reefs for example in in places where it's not very far away from the shore but it can be exceptional right they, they, they can be whatever they want they live in tropical and subtropical ecosystems then we have the oceanic manta ray which has a pre, uh, presumably it has more um a it has more like a pelagic area okay they have they inhabit areas where it's far away from the shorelines and that also makes it very difficult for scientists to study this species because it's expensive uh, and also it's far away from 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 shore so those are uh, the distribution uh, globally of the different species uh, and then we have the Caribbean manta ray. So this, uh, there, there has been a few studies about the differences between these manta rays. Hopefully we're gonna publish soon. And then you can, uh, uh, people that are interested in this can uh, understand more about uh, genetics, taxonomy, etc. But here is just, uh, I would like to show you a little bit of, of the similarities as you can see on the right image. This one looks from the upper part like a reef manta with the, this white, patch coloration and then you can see uh, the manta ray on the left has the, the spots and the, the spot patterns underneath the gills which means it's an oceanic manta ray right and then the coloration like oceanic manta ray so uh, we're still working on that there is some being some biopsy samples that have been taken and we are doing other kind of work that we're trying to understand more about this species uh, as you can see also there is a whale shark on the back 
Um, the anatomy of the manta. Okay, so the anatomy of the manta is like they have dorsal fin, eyes, cephalic fins, gill slit, pelvic fins, and tail. It can be confusing with the pelvic fins and uh, related with the with the gender of the manta, which I'm gonna explain you uh, in a bit. So mantas have a very very tiny teeth that actually they don't have a like a specific purpose just when it's the time for reproduction. I'm gonna show you the mating and courtship a um, video where you can see that uh, probably is the only use mantas give to this kind of tooth, okay? So, okay, as I already explained you, the unique spot pattern, uh, that's the way we can record each individual. So for the Mexican Caribbean database, we have uh, over 450 um, identified manta rays and we have our database. This database helps us to understand about ecology and biology of the species. For example, uh, we had in 2018 uh, 33 recitings, right? So that helps us to understand where manta rays are going, like who is coming again, who is not showing up. So one of the most amazing uh, experience that I had was last year with a team, we were uh, analyzing some pictures and we had a record of a manta ray in 2010 and we didn't see her uh, for eight years. So, and then we saw her again last year and it was just, Amazing, right? We were so happy because this kind of information, this data, it's so valuable to keep recording because in the future it can give us a better insight what is happening with the population in the Mexican Caribbean. Each project uh, has uh, their own uh, specific uh, scientific uh, objectives. In our case, because of the sources that we have, ID uh, by picturing, it's, it's great and it helps us a lot uh, to identify as well sex of the manta rays, which I'm gonna show you in a bit. So this, this, uh, this slide show you how each manta ray have their own, sp uh, their own uh, individual spots. Uh, they look very similar. They look, oh, this one, not this one, but with databases, this help us to understand more about who is coming and who is living and who is not showing up anymore. So this is very, very important and it's quite a cheap uh, method to, uh, to collect data from manta rays. So here it is, a manta gender, we have the female, we have the cloaca here, as you can see, and then we have the pelvic fins. Uh, for manta males, it can be a little bit tricky. This is a great quality picture. So as you can see, the claspers uh, are very, in this, in this case, are very calcified. So that means it's a mature, male and then we have an immature male in the middle but then if you don't have a good picture this can be a problem right because then you cannot identify properly and it's better to say we don't know than to uh, register an individual that we are not sure what is happening with their sex okay identification so we have to be very precise and we have to be very uh, uh, we try to get as many pictures as we can. Video, it's always recommended, but it's not always possible. So here is another uh, a picture that I wanted to show you. There with mature email, immature. So with the picture identification, that's why the scientists and researchers were trying to, to go over and over and over to the database and the pictures to make sure we are collecting the accurate data, right? So sometimes it cannot be determined like this ones. And um, you know, some of the predators of manta rays are sharp and they can get like a little souvenir on the back and um, well this can affect the identification um, sex for us once we have to identify a specific individual. So uh, we are also currently collecting some plankton samples trying to understand what the manta rays are eating. Uh, we also have the drone. Uh, the drone uh, there was a, a project we we're trying to start to try to measure mantas uh, by using the drone. So I would like to show you this video. Uh, there is a PVC of one meter and then we fly the drone always a specific height, let's say 10 meter. So then with that, we can have some uh, program that can help us to, to have more accurate measurements of the manta wing to wing. The problem is like the mantas uh, are, you know, they have to swim all the time, all their lives forever in order to have uh, oxygen. So they cannot stop. So in doing these little uh, movements, it can change the size of, of our approximations. We can be wrong, right? But 
science also is that we have to try we have to to test we have to 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 do what we can to understand uh, and if it doesn't work we can try again another thing right so here you can see the manta is feeding manta rays have uh, a, there are eight properly described a manta feeding strategies, which is very interesting because many people just think they're just feed, but with time, scientists have been able to understand more about these amazing animals as you can see. This one is a surface feeding, which means they are concentrating, uh, their food are, it's concentrating on the, on, the, on the surface. So she's trying to get as much food as it possible. These animals feed a lot. They need to, to, to take advantage when there is food available. And we have our amazing uh, manta lover there. It's uh, one of our uh, scientists there. Um, well, this is just an example. This video is for like seven minutes, so maybe uh, we can share it. You can watch it in our social media. Um, I would like to talk about now the food. This is in Spanish, I'm sorry, but I will explain you in English. So the diet of a giant consists in plankton. As you can see, these modified gills help them to uh, sustain the, the food in, and then they flush the water under the, the gills, right? So uh, plankton are, it's very, very important for the ecosystem and are the smaller microorganisms in the ocean. Um, despite the mantas are so big and can be very big, they can reach uh, sizes, the oceanic manta of seven meters and the reef manta or five meters and they still feed from the smaller microorganisms uh, in the ocean, right? So they are totally harmless. Uh, according to, remember I told you about the uh, feeding strategies. There is a, have, there have been uh, some strategies formally described about this. So pygmy feeding is something that the manta ray, it's like swimming and then another one comes uh, above them, but it's not, it's not really touching it, okay? It just, it just, creating this like a funnel for both of them. And this can only have been seen maybe in the Maldives, okay? In the Caribbean, we cannot see uh, this. Um, all of these images are from the, from, the Maldive, uh, from the Maldivian project, which is the biggest uh, manta ray research project in the world. It, they have over 5,000 uh, manta rays registered there. Um, well, with this one, the pygmy feeding, uh, you can see how they kind of line up. Uh, and this also can show you how these animals can be so smart, okay? Like many people are like, oh yeah, but fishes, you know, fish are fish. But actually manta rays have the biggest uh, brain in comparison with the, with, the, with the body mass of all fish, right? So there is a lot of things that we still need to understand about manta rays, but the feeding strategies they use, it can help us to try to understand, okay, we understand, the, we know that, the, the brain is big, but then how they use it in the regular life on a, to feed or to, to, you know, like this can give you a better insight about these animals. So we have on the right, the summer soul feeding is uh, something that you see very common in many regions where they normally, you know, they do this uh, barrel rolling as well. So they, there is a patch of plankton in the column of water. So they try to take advantage, advantage as much as they can. Okay, so that's very smart too because not all animals will develop that, uh, that, uh, that intellect, right? But let's say to, to, to fit in that way. Then we have the chain one, which is on the right. This is a, an amazing spectacle in, in the Maldives. Uh, manta rays there can congregate over 100 or 200 manta rays at the same time. These ones are reef manta rays, the ones that I'm showing to you in this slide. So what it happens is like, one manta ray goes in the in the front and then the other one the back on the back on the back and they they can just line up as many as they can if if they want to fit but also this is a it, like plankton itself you know plankton doesn't move by itself it moves by water currents and wind okay so then this could be a strategy for plankton to avoid predators but then mantas are smarter so then they can just line up and try to fit from and take as, as much food as they can. Then we have the mass feeding. The mass feeding is like a lot of manta rays that are trying to, they, they, they make this a uh, vortex and 
the cyclone in order to congregate all the plankton in the middle and then that's the way they feed. This is an amazing strategy that an animal can create in, in collaboration, right? So this is very, very, very important to try to understand mantra intelligence. And the surface feeding, which is super, uh, uh, is the most common one to, to observe in our region as, uh, at least. Uh, that's the way normally we can find manta rays. We see them in the surface feeding. And um, there are other uh, manta ray tactics, but uh, those ones are explained in the guide. I, I, I didn't uh, put them here, but uh, I can explain later if you want, just to uh, have a general understanding about feeding strategies. This is one of the, of the videos that you can see how they can feed lining up so you can see how the little particles there you can see there are, it's plankton so then one goes in the front the other one back 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 and then at some point maybe the last one will reach enough food but this this shows how they can just congregate in the specific regions for food this is hanifaru bay uh, one of the most amazing places if you like manta rays Ooh, um, Okay, so another thing uh, very interesting about manta rays courtship and mating is like normally these actions occur in cleaning stations. A, a female releases a pheromone, the water acting as a signal on this, and then males it's, it's time to to congregate, you know. A, and then a courtship trains can be, I mean, can last for a couple of hours or even days. Okay, so this is very. Um, the, the mantor, the female manta ray goes in the front, she's playing around, you know, like the regular life. We have to make things harder sometimes because it's not like for everyone, okay? So we have to, um, I, I wanted to show you a video which shows actually better how does the courtship works. So this is not from us, actually the, the, the credits are there. This is the month of passion. So I think some people have seen it on the YouTube, but this, you can see how the male on the back is trying to, you know, to, to, to get into the manta ray. What they normally do, and that's probably the only use of their tooth is that, to bite the left side wing. And then once that it's like kind of well attached, they normally go, up to the surface. Remember the manta rays cannot stop moving, okay? So this also can create why they are so smart. They can be very nearby the surface in order to avoid falling apart directly, right? So this is taking some time. You can see how they go, the, manta, the female manta ray goes a little bit more and more surface and now it's coming the action soon. So, and then the, man, the, the male is gonna insert one of the claspers in the cloaca and then uno, dos, tres, cuatro, boom. And it's like, I mean, just a couple of seconds, right? So, <laughs> and then uh, once that they do it, they just split and they are just like on their way. Okay, bye. So fortunately, uh, if, if we're lucky, uh, that man that's lucky is gonna get pregnant and then, we will have our manta burrito after a couple of months, okay? And not only a couple, normally the, the, the manta pregnancy, which also makes it very vulnerable in a, as a species, it takes about over a year to have this manta pregnant. Imagine to have this, uh, this pup in the belly for so long, okay? So you can see here, how does a, uh, uh, Amanta looks pregnant on the left. You can see from the side and then from the back. All of these pictures are from um, Guy Stevens, Dr. Guy Stevens. And then we have some uh, Manta burrito here on the uh, lower left. So normally when uh, Mantas only give birth to one pup, okay, after uh, over a year of, of, of pregnancy uh, time. And the Manta rays are uh, just coming out from the cloaca, they are fully independent. They don't, uh, they don't stay with the mom, okay? They're all viviparous, like, a, like the whale sharks, okay? So they give birth, they start to open their wings and they're truly independent, okay? This is uh, something very interesting about them. And also I wanted to show you on the right down, you can see the maiden scars. That's the way researchers, we can see also how if there is a manta ray that the reach or has been uh, reproducing, uh, normally females, 
reproduce, they don't reach their reproduction age not until 15 years old, imagine. And then males, 10 years old. So imagine all of the, all of the, the, the obstacles that mantra rays have to go through in order to reproduce themselves, right? So it's, it's such a low uh, fecundity and a slow reproduction and everything so that makes them very, very vulnerable. Ah, okay, so now I would like to talk about other research that we're currently doing, which is marine research. Uh, we are uh, currently collecting microplastic samples. Uh, our last report, it's available in our website. Uh, I, I want to say thank you to uh, Dr. Pe Pelamati, which helped us with some, um, uh, some details with this, um, with this project. And here we can see how the, the the mandatrol is working. This is a research that we have been doing for since 2013. As we consider that manta rays, also one of the biggest uh, threats for manta rays can be uh, marine debris, right? Um, in this case, we're trying to adopt met methodologies. It's very difficult because with the troll, it's only the surface, but what about the rest of the layers? So we're trying to adapt methodologies at this moment. We are uh, doing a combination between uh, five gyres and um, but gyres protocols and NOAA protocols. Okay, so we're developing that. Here, what we normally do, we collect the samples. We have a lot of sargassum in previous years in the Caribbean, which makes it super challenging to collect the samples. But we have here a Brittany, it's our marine debris manager. So she's in charge to analyze all the samples in a Cozumel laboratory lab. So she goes there and analyze, and that's the result that we have is thanks to her work. Uh, I wanted to show you just a little bit of the of the trolling that we have done, uh, not only in the north part of Yucatan's Peninsula, but we have been working last year also in Cozumel region, thanks to CONAM for their support. Um, okay, uh, here we have the breaching. Okay, so many people ask like, why manta rays or devil or devil rays uh, jump? Okay, so no one knows uh, specifically why, but there is like, the most accepted theories is because they remove parasites from their bodies, a, a courtship behavior, birding communication, or it can be just for fun, okay? This picture uh, on the right down, it's from our region. It was taken by one of our captains. Um, uh, let me show you this amazing video of one of uh, uh, a tourist from Cozumel. <laughs> he was able to send us this. Look at this. Oh my God. So manta rays, uh, I don't know if they feel like they're not heavier or what, but <laughs> they make a huge splash. So by this splash also, you know, the sound can travel through this water. So it can give a sign to other of their species. Okay, I will play it again because I really like it. Okay, again. So here it comes, here it comes. Ooh, there we go. The, and one of the most interesting things about manta rays uh, breachings here is like we have so many, like so many. In a day, in a research trip, we have probably count over 150 breaches from manta rays. It's insane. So it's just like splash, 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 like a party there. It's so amazing. Manta rays are so interesting, but we are currently don't know why they exactly do it. I'm sorry, I just got excited. Okay, so manta natural predators are tiger sharks, uh, orca or killer whales, or great hammerheads. As you can see here, they can get some uh, kiss to manta rays. It's not really kiss, they really want to bite them. Um, but uh, manta rays, uh, uh, as some species of shark and uh, other last moran have developed an amazing uh, strategy of healing okay so look at this super big kiss from a shark in a manta ray and then after a year there we go such an amazing ability to heal this is incredible right uh, some other species have shown this kind of um, ability to heal but in this case i wanted to show you about manta rays in our population in the caribbean only 13 percent of our population is it's it has some kind of a uh, shark love not really but it's just bites um okay the mantis spa these are very important uh, uh, places for to 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 socialize if we can say in some way or another one manta rays need 
Uh, what is this? Ah, I'm getting something there. Uh, I'm sorry, it jumped, something popped up from the, from the screen. I didn't know what it was. Okay, so manta rays visit uh, cleaning stations. Cleaning stations are super important for them because that's the way they get clean, right? Like us, we take showers, other species of elasmo ranch and other fish goes to, to this kind of spas to, in order to make their bodies uh, clean. And also it helps a lot if there is an injury or something to clean it and then eventually to get better, okay? I will go to scroll faster here. What, what? Okay, mantas are at risk. Uh, as I said, like uh, mantra rays have one life up uh, every uh, two, even like two, seven years, it has been suggested. And they reach maturity very old, um, 10 to 15 years old. They are very vulnerable. Um, one of the, uh, three of them identify uh, threats for mantra rays. It's targeted uh, fisheries, uh, bycatch, and marine debris, okay? so. This is sad to watch, but this is very important in order to, to be able to, to take decisions, to act with responsibility, and that many people get discouraged. Oh no, the oceans are falling apart, but we still have the chance to change. How we can do it with our choices every day and supporting organizations that are doing research, conservation, education, and get involved too, right? So, uh, this is just a, a, a map that I wanted to show you uh, because it, it's really uh, concerning. And it, this is this one, it doesn't even include Mexico, for example, right? Uh, in, in, in general terms, like direct fisheries affect all uh, like populations, like a lot, right? Incidental fisheries, normally in tuna fisheries, it can be very harmful for manta ray species. So I would suggest you to make sure where does your food, uh, you know, you learn how, where do you, does your food come from? The, the label and everything, it's a problem. I have heard some other talks with like Reiki or other shark researchers about the labeling, right? That's very important. And well, we're, there is so many things to do, but uh, let's try to let's try to focus on, on the positive and let's try to make things happen. Uh, another very important thing is the national, international legislation, right? So in this case, uh, manta ray, all mobilized rates are uh, in, in, uh, protected in the uh, CITES Convention uh, since 2013. And uh, also the uh, Convention of the Conservation of Migratory Species, uh, all mobile species as well. Uh, for the Mexican government now, uh, it, I, I want to focus on this because this is just a new a thing that happened at the end of last year, uh, thanks to Dr. Ramon Montil, which was the person that uh, delivered all the information related with taxonomy and all the work that was needed to make uh, all mobile rates in our country be part of a special protection, okay? So as you can see here, uh, it's in the norm 059, which for many people cannot make sense. So that's why I uh, put this information extra there. So there is, uh, there is not allowed to fish them, to catch them, anything with them, okay? So this helps a lot. Uh, one of the most important tools that we require for conservation or, uh, uh, and education is the support of a uh, policy, right? We need to do that because if we don't have national protection, even if we encourage uh, encourage communities, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, another uh, project that we're currently going uh, doing is ghost fishing. Uh, ghost fishing is not something illegal. It's just abandoned and discarded uh, fishing materials that have been uh, disposed in the ocean. This is a collaboration we have with the Global Go Global Ghost Gear Initiative. Um, uh, last year we were in Panama uh, presenting our proposal to address the ghost fishing in my, the Mexican Caribbean. So we're starting with with surveys for the whole year, the rest of the year. Well, not now, but uh, after this situation, hopefully we will be able to go back. This video, as you can see how the manta is so calm in some way or another, and it's trying to, to, to get some help, right? This captain was able to remove this, um, this line and a uh, manta rays cannot swim backwards. So like, like they cannot go in reverse, they just keep swimming. So this is, this is another threat. Ju they just get, you know, entangled and entangled, probably they're just gonna die, right? So you can see how this uh, captain was able to help her. Um, well, 
uh, yes, this video is available on our social media if you want to watch it again. And solutions take action. This is the most important thing to do. Uh, there are many, many things to do that you can do. Uh, you can check sustainable seafood choices. There is a man to trust a specific section in the website where you can find uh, what to do uh, related with the with the seafood. There is also uh, like seafood uh, fish base. Uh, I don't remember the name. I somebody can help me with the name of this. Like uh, if you consume fish, you can find it. I totally forgot. Um, also community building, uh, capa capacity building with the community engagement with the people. Give them training. Uh, we currently provide training to uh, different captains, uh, communities. Uh, tour guides, everyone that is interested, they can get for free these uh, talks in order to learn about amazing, the amazing manta rays. Uh, another thing that I wanted to, to say, this is very important, how you interact with manta rays. There is a specific, uh, uh, this is a, 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 a strategy and a, a um, project from the Manta Trust, uh, how to swim with mantas. Respecting their distance is very important. These are only for Caribbean because in the Mexican Caribbean, diving is not allowed with them. Actually, tourism is, uh, we're still working on, on the management program, but doesn't mean that you cannot encounter a manta ray and just will, you will forget about her, right? You're gonna try to see her. So it's very important. To, 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 to respect the distance, as you can see here, all of these are available in this, in this, in this website. Um, also, uh, this is one of the biggest accomplishments that we have. This is, uh, this code of conduct were accepted by the government in our region. So this is gonna be part of the management program for our, our, our Caribbean region. It's very important because this is the way we can improve and uh, get better good practices with interaction with wildlife, right? Uh, don't touch, please. The manta rays have a very, uh, like a mucus on their skin that protects them, so don't touch them. And always leave three meters or more from you and the manta rays. They, they're very curious. They're going to watch you, especially many people that have been in Rebia Hedo have never been there. But uh, it's how amazing they interact. So you can check all of this in this, uh, uh, this information. Another thing, we have volunteer programs. Uh, our programs have a cost. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, many people are like, you know, what does it cost? We have very expensive uh, uh, things to pay, the boat and everything. Some things are included, some others not, but I will encourage you to visit our website and you can get involved. Uh, spread mental love through education. This is something that we do all the time when we are not on the field. We get to know the, the, we go to schools. This guy on the on the bottom with the snorkel, he won the environmental festival in 2017, and we took him to swim with the whale sharks. So many people is like that. Now, if they don't see what is in the ocean, they don't fall in love. So let's make the new generations get involved in this amazing uh, in this amazing. Uh, thing, right? Manta rays, oh, uh, sharks, everything. It's very, very important. Uh, we also have this poster. If you have any manta ray uh, from the Caribbean or other part of the world, you can submit it to Manta Trust or you can submit it uh, to us. Uh, I invite you to take a look at all of the websites. This is a specific website with the blue sources. The blue sources, it's uh, for fishing. This is a researcher and his associate director from the Manta Trust, Daniel Fernando, Dr. Daniel Fernando, which has an amazing uh, background on fisheries. So you can make sure that you can check uh, his, his work. It's amazing. So please check that. And well, my mail there if somebody wants to take a look. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I don't know. Jay, are you still there? <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much. That was really, really great. Can't believe how much you compacted into 45 minutes. It was amazing. Oh. I'm surprised you're not out of breath right now. That was a lot, no. a lot of great information want, in such a short period. Can you see my screen? I just wanted to show this. Okay, this is one of the guides that you can see. There is a website, the NHBS, where you can get all the Manta information. And I also have this Amazing Manta book for all Manta lovers. This is from Dr. Stevens, the uh, founder of the, the Manta Trust and Thomas Peshak. So you can take a look at this amazing uh, information. And uh, well, if it's for Manta lovers. If you want to just <laughs> look, please do it. Awesome. Thank you. Very good. I, we have the, well, the first book, uh, the guide in our office. It's uh, one of my favorites. Really great book. 
Um, cool. So guys, uh, let's open up some questions for you. We've already got a few piling in. So let's uh, get some questions rolling for you. Uh, Faye says, great talk. Thank you. You mentioned that you sometimes see mantas several years apart. Do we know how long they live? And is it different for oceanic mantas and reef mantas? Yes. Yes. Actually, I you know, there is so much information that I would like to give, but I don't have time, right? So, uh, yes, manta rays can reach, a, they can live for 50 or over 50 years old. So, uh, it, I would like to have better uh, information about our research, and, um, you know, because it takes years in order to understand what's happening with populations, and maybe it, it takes so long to understand what's happening, right? Maybe with tags, tagging or everything, we can get better insights. Awesome. So Rachel asks, hi Karen, thank you so much for this webinar. Can I ask if you have time to reply, what type of drone do you use for imaging? And are there any issues you have with the drones or cameras? Um, are there functions you need but don't have now? Uh, well, the drone that we use, it's a Swell Pro. Swell Pro is a water drone, so if it falls, it's okay. Uh, that's great. But also in Mexico, it's mandatory to have registration of drones, okay? So in our case, we have registered our drone because we do research. We work under specific research permits by, because we work within marine protected areas. And the drone has been amazing. I mean, we bought for the first, that one, thanks to a donation, we were able to buy this drone and it has a, such a great material that it doesn't allow to salt to uh, destruct the material. So I will definitely recommend it. And the quality is 4K, which is more than enough, I think. Awesome. So JD says, I'm a frequent diver in Cozumel. Are there any certain times of year to observe mantas near to Cozumel? Uh, manta rays cannot, I mean, they can show up wherever they want, right? But. Uh, it's not a common sight to see manta rays, but it can happen. They can probably just crossing, they can just be, you know, feeding somewhere, but that's not the, normally the area where we find them in our region. Yeah, I used to, fun fact, I actually used to work in Cozumel for a few years. Um, and I think in my two and a half years or three years of working there and diving almost six days a week, I seen a reef manta once in the entire time out of probably about 4,000 dives I did there, something crazy. Wow. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but, uh, but also though for JD is you could go, you I mean, it's not too far away, but you could head up to towards Isla Mahadas and where um, Karen and them work, which is not a super far journey. There are operations that would, you know, pick you up and like take the ferry from Playa to Playa to Carmen and pick you up there to go see them up there and everything like that. And yeah, check out the um, work that they're doing. Sometimes uh, mantas can be seen along with the, with the whale sharks, right? So they feed from the same, uh, like from the plankton. So sometimes that's a way uh, people help us with ID uh, the picture with the, with the mantas. Awesome. So uh, Tom asks, Karen, amazing talk. So much great information. Thank you. Um, what are some of the challenges you face when trying to convert fishermen towards conservation? Do you still find illegal manta fishing even with CITES protection in Mexico? Well, uh, first, yes, there, the challenges of uh, working with communities are all the time, every day, forever, right? So <laughs> I, I consider that one of the most important uh, skills that we have to be, develop as conservationists is to be uh, to have this empathy for, for what traditions and cultural things have been. It doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do, but we have to understand the other uh, people's uh, way of living in order to make things happen, to transform, and more than transform, to understand, right? To understand why, why, why we have to coexist with this species, right? So if there is still uh, some, um, some illegal fishing, yes. Uh, it was, there is still illegal fishing. Uh, we're still working on that, but I believe strongly that we can make this happen with the collaboration of government, communities, and uh, science. No, I totally agree with that. I mean, here in Baja, actually in my 
throwing keyboards around. But um, here in Baja, tomorrow, actually, when I give the talk, I'll talk a little bit about it, is we see a lot of fishing with uh, Mabiel Monkeyana. Um, because one, they're very easy to catch at the surface since they school in these huge schools. Um, and you see it throughout the year, not just in the aggregation season too, um, even in national parks and extremely protected areas, we still see it. Um, so it's just trying to, like the, we work with Marta Palacio, is trying to work with them within the communities to try and teach them why and not just, you know, slap them on the hand and say, no, that's bad, is more teaching them why, why it's important and how it can help their community and help the, you know, help them and all that kind of stuff. Awesome. So Christine says, phenomenal presentation. Thank you for sharing your story with us. I understand that mantas do not stop ever, but how do they recuperate and restore their energy to continue onward? Um, and also, are they family orientated within their species? Well, for this question, I, I just wanted to make clear that when they stop, it's probably because they or they got entangled, for example, in this case, they cannot, they, they get stressed probably, and they just probably get entangled with the line or something. So recovering, it's something that all species of race do as well. We have seen it with other species where they have been trapped, and then after the release, they normally slow go on the top, you know, nearby the surface and take some time to, to recover, right? I have seen like, for example, even with sharks, I don't know specifically, but sometimes, you know, they're like in the specific positions and they just take time to recover. In this specific question about they, how they restore their energy, what, while they have flowing of water in their bodies, the oxygen goes through, right? So it's like, I, I can't, I can't, I cannot, uh, I can compare it with us. Like when we are short of breath, for example, you take some time to sit down and then a little bit, and little, little by little, you can recover. So I think it can be the same with Manta. Like they don't fully stop swimming, but they just maybe take a little bit longer to recover. Awesome. And in, the case, in the case of the, sorry, in case of the reef stations, when they are just in the spa and it's the same, like when you're in the pedicure or the manicure, you're so relaxed, right? So you're <laughs> not stressed. So you're, the, the, the floating system, uh, the, the flowing of blood system still going. So it's, it's okay. Awesome. Great. So Anonymous asked, uh, with the five gyres manta trolling experiment, I know they collect this data from around the world. Is it possible to elaborate on your findings or their findings and what the end goal with that data is? Yes. So we initially uh, get uh, got collaborate get collaborate in collaboration with them because we thought that it could be uh, one of the projects that we can go along with the mantle research, right? Because we go to the mantle research, why we don't go with the trolling? It's very tricky because. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, to know this is just an approximation of what is in the surface, but what about the other layers, right? So it's, it's very difficult, but still with the research we have, it's available. So you can just take a look what it's about. Doesn't mean that it's completed. We still need to find a better insights to understand better the ocean, uh, also characteristics, right? All of the influence, the environmental influences that can be modifying the concentration or not of microplastics in a specific regions by a specific seasons, right? So the goal of this data is to, to address and create awareness, but also to create like a kind of a database of microplastic research. Each region it's allowed to adapt uh, their their methodology because not every not all the sites are the same and if my understanding is correct there there are t 13 manta trolls from five gyres around uh, the globe right one of those ones it's in our region awesome so sue asks is there anywhere in the world where you can see both reef and oceanic mantas at the same time or do they have totally distinct population ranges yeah, well, uh, there actually there is a slide where it shows where is like the reef manta uh, distribution and where are the uh, biorostris distribution, right? So one of the biggest questions is like if they, you know, get together, what is happening? If they and no, so far not. And in our region, if you ask me, I will say that they are living around. So they don't go very far away. Those are my observations, okay? And our research, they go somewhere, but we don't know where, right? They can go very deep. They can go somewhere around the Gulf of Mexico where we're trying to understand if there is any correlation with populations with the, with the Florida area. 
and uh, Gulf of Mexico region and our area and with the rest of the Caribbean because I mean Manta Ray's connectivity can be while well, there is food what well, subtropical and tropical waters so it can be very tricky to to uh, to say right but in our region, from my observations with the manta rays, I can I can pretty much say they live around somewhere. <laughs> awesome. So Carrie asks, do you have any idea where they give birth? No, we don't. We don't know that. Uh, uh, hello, Carrie. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, no, the only like manta ray nursery ha was found by Dr. Stewart in in Florida, actually. Uh, so no. We don't know, but uh, it's it's one of the biggest questions where they give birth, where the juveniles are. I mean, it's we don't know so much things. And uh, I mean, one of the top uh, mantra researchers, it's like Carrie and Dr. Robin, okay, mm -hmm. uh, Giuseppe and Dr. Stevens. I mean, there is uh, Stuart. I mean, so many that because of them, we know what we know, right? And other more, but it's so, it's so amazing that we don't know so many about these species. Like they have been so long in the ocean and we still don't know a lot about, about them. Yeah, I find that amazingly incredible. I remember the first time I did a trip with um, Dr. Rubin and Carrie and them and it was oh, just, you asked very, like just, it's an unreal how much we don't know. You know I mean, I always found that really beautiful talking to Bob and everything. It's, uh, it's you know, it's incredible. It's great. But I think it's one of the most amazing things to keep exploring to, mm -hmm. oh, what is going to happen? What is this? What they're doing? I think it's one of, it is in our bio, human biology to try to understand more. And it's amazing. Probably we, no. we never know, but trying doesn't harm anyone. No, exactly. It's awesome. So Jose Luis asks, um, he says, gracias, Karen. I loved your talk. Where can we get those books? Mm, the link, it's in the last slide. So okay. it, it's in a www.nhbs.com, so you can find both of the... Yeah, I can put the, it in the chat too for yes, everybody. It's in both, both of the books. You can find the, the super amazing uh, desk uh, manta ray book, and then you can find the field guide, which is absolutely amazing. The, the field guide gives you a better insight of all the molded rays, including the ones that you see in Baja, the ones that you see in the Indian Ocean, in Mexico, everywhere. Perfect. Um, awesome. So let's see. So Vinny asks, thank you for the presentation, Karen. How much are manta rays disrupted by human boats and ships with loud engines? And do they ever get injured by the ships? Uh, yes, there is uh, injuries that have been uh, observed in our region, at least and in other uh, projects around the world. So that's why I was a little bit, uh, I was very fast with this slide, but it's very important the, the code of conduct. The code of conduct can improve 50% of the encounters with these amazing animals, right? Normally they are feeding, so we, if we stop in front of them, well, it, I mean, it's like you're eating and then somebody comes and you know, hey, let me take a picture, right? So this kind of, of, of behavior can disrupt their natural behavior, right? But there, that's why the code of conduct is such an amazing tool to, to, to use. The, the, the website that I gave to you, it's, it's everyone can access and they, they, can, they can take a look at this code of conduct and uh, well, uh, talk with your tour operators or the people that you work with uh, in order to make it happen, right? In, in our case, we are an organization that have been working uh, closely in our region with the government and community. So we decided these code of conducts were going to be accepted by everyone, right? So this is, this is the best, but doesn't mean that it cannot be, it, they cannot be used in other regions. You can use them because this is, this is a result of a scientific work from a different uh, scientists from the Manta Trust to release this code of conduct. It's not like somebody suddenly had an idea, ah, oh, we're gonna keep this distance. This is the result of a, a, a many years of work, how they interact with manta ray. Awesome, and going on from that, Crystal asks, um, do you know of any t reputable tourist programs in Mexico to see mantas that actually follow this code of conduct? 
Uh, I cannot, I have, I have never been with Monterey interaction in other parts of Mexico that it's not my region. And I went to the Project Pacific, uh, Manta Proyecto, how is it called? I'm sorry, Proyecto Manta Pacifico, which is from uh, Dr. Josh Stewart in Bahia Banderas. I was a, uh, uh, lucky to be there for a while and there is no tourism there and in our region it's only because they found them with the well shirts right so it's just a coincidence that we have that we are putting a lot of effort to integrate all of the information that we we can as other regions i think also in your region and uh, in baja i think there is some work going on with uh, with Pelagios and other organizations trying to improve the management programs and everything. So, uh, yeah, I think this is the way of going and collaboration. It's very important. We cannot just, uh, don't do that. Don't know. It's just, we have to get together because ocean uh, challenges are bigger than us. Okay. So we have to get together. Yeah, exactly. It's definitely the way forward. Um, cool. So Juliet asks, uh, thank you so much. This was so interesting. I did not know a lot about manta rays and they're such cool organisms. So. Ah, thank you, Juliet. <laughs> I thought it was I a question. Juliet, but <laughs> it's, a manta lover. Anyway. it's a manta lover, probably. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> so Simone says, thank you so much for your awesome talk. I really love your passion for mantas. Do you have a little bit of time to explain your educational background? Like, how did you end up becoming a manta expert? And thank you so much for all the information. I'm not a manta expert, I'm a manta lover. I have learned everything from amazing, amazing scientists that they have collaborated with us for the last uh, years, which all the manta trust people, amazing. They are, a, I'm not a scientist, I study management and tourism, right? But uh, I love uh, organizing, planning uh, numbers. I love my community, I love manta rays, and I believe that a multidisciplinary approach to conservation, it's needed, right? So basically, I think there is something in you, right? You, I cannot explain it. It's just, I mean, I love the ocean and I cannot see myself doing something else, right? So in the, in the journey, you learn and you can auto, uh, like, auto start learning about biology, ecology, read a lot. And I still have so many questions, eh? This is it's not, it's not easy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Awesome. So uh, Sarah says, hi, Karen, super presentation and energy. So interesting. About the relationship between mantas and sharks, I used to dive in Costa Rica at a dive site famous for bull sharks, but we would very often see mantas hanging around too. Is it because specifically bull sharks would not attack them or because food quantity is stronger than the risk of being kissed on the butt? <laughs> it can be both, right? In this case, I, I, will, I will think that, well, a sharks are top predators right so if it's it's like with the mantas right manta rays can feed from a specific species of plankton and uh, and well sharks feed from a specific for krill let's say right and then manta rays prefer another thing these kind of animals these species of animals they will take what it's available okay so it's like if you have guacamole but you like more salsa mexicana <laughs> it's like okay but i there there is no boat you will take one right so it's the same with with animals like especially them they they are big animals they need to feed from the quantities so in this case i have never been diving in costa rica so i probably will think that it's because the food that bull sharks prefer it's available instead of going after a manta awesome. perfect so um, Jesus asked, I'm just going to translate it. He says, uh, very good presentation and great information um, on these animals. He wanted to ask about the sanctions from NOM 59. If they are, are, are they being applied already in Mexico with the new introductions of adding mobulas and mantis to them? Yeah, this is a very, uh, this is very tricky, let's say, because our process to, uh, you know, to get the people, first in Mexico, you need to call to Profepa, right? Profepa are the, like the police in the, from these kind of uh, events. So unfortunately in our country, the reduction of budgets to have rangers and uh, directors of a specific regions has been a challenge. It's like, we have like a internal like 
two rangers in the whole country or something like that. It's ridiculous. And that's why it's important to congregate all of these elements that I was talking about. Like we cannot rely all the time on the law or in the government or, oh, when they're gonna come, what they're doing, they're not doing what they should. Probably they don't, probably they do. They try their best. In our case, the, the, the people that we work, they are just like tied on the hand. So if we create these relationships with fishermen, with captains, with communities, they can be the guardians of the mantas. That's, that, that's why I always say, right? Like, let's, let's give them uh, an alternative in order to make this transition, right? So in this case, the, the sanctions are like even jail, you know, like you can go to jail to, to, to kill a specific animal. For manta rays, they're in special protection. Uh, you cannot fish them. If you get a jaguar, the same, but that doesn't mean it's not happening, right? There is a long way to go in order to, to change really the whole system. But what we can do, it's like a, like to get involved with projects, right? Because this is this is a, the only way that I can see that can be efficient in the long term. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think just something to add to that is, I mean, in a lot of areas that we've seen in Mexico here in Bajas, um, like are the Comité de Vigilancia, uh, um, vigilance committees that are created underneath CONAMP and PROPEPA and these kind of things to do the monitoring for them um, to, since you're on the water. Here in Cabo, we have uh, Saving Los Cabos, which was uh, created between a group of different operators here, um, myself included, and a few other really great people. Um, and basically, now you have eyes on the water all the time that are reporting, making reports, and all that, filing it to PROPEPA, um, pushing for change and these kind of things, and pushing to protect the animals in the area as well as the park and you know the environment in general. General. Um, and these kind of organizations, I think, is one way to continue doing work um, and also getting that community involved with these organizations to, you know, the more people, like you said, if you have the captains wanting to protect them and the marineros and the crew and the guides and the tourists, if everybody's trying to protect them, it's going to make it much and much harder for them for anyone to be breaking these laws, you know what I mean, for doing anything like that. And also, of course, the, 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 incent, the economic incentive, no? that's very important yeah. because we need to eat, we need to work, mm -hmm. we, you know, especially in specific regions, it can be tricky to abort, like conservation or something can be, weak. but uh, that, that's the way to go, I think. And uh, well, I think there are so many good examples around the world where things are happening, right? So that's, yeah. that's uh, good stuff. So Sarah says one more, another question. Why would, how, why would justify, how would you justify the different regulations about the distance or even being able to say swim with mantas with the same, within the same country? Um, and how can you really respect the distances when you are doing research or want good quality pictures or videos? Yeah. Okay. So the, the regulations about the distance can be, uh, I mean, the, the research has been done. Okay, so the sources are available, but these kind of implementations have probably the, the ideal would be that they have to be, they have to be bring by communities or a nonprofit or organization that actually don't have, you know, like a, like a, a like a benefit uh, specifically of the code of conduct right so it's it's as a researcher and in the water you get to know the animal behavior with years so you know that they don't like specific things you cannot be in a specific position so we always take distance you know to take the id in our area it's not allowed to free dive with the whale sharks for example now it's they require the life jacket but in this case the tourism it's huge right there is so many people doing the same activity so it's it's overwhelming it cannot be controlled unless code of conducts are implemented right so in i don't know specific for which region can be adapted but i will suggest to take a look at the website of swimwithmantas.org and maybe it can give you a better insight how to address uh, how to adapt a specific uh, uh, regulations in your country or in your project awesome uh Next is the compliment from Tanya. She said, lovely talk, Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Esmeralda. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, Esmeralda is. says, um, is it possible that the different species of mantas could mate? I don't know. I don't think so, but I don't know. 
I don't know. I would be curious. I mean, you. why not? But because some of them share the same, uh, they can, you know, maybe find each other in some way. But for example, in our region, we have this like probably the third subspecies of mantas, which can be very curious, right? To see why. But normally it's because we, we think that it's because of the migration that at one point was with the Atlantic, uh, with the Oceanic Manta Ray, and then, I don't know, it's it's complicated. I, I wouldn't mm -hmm. say anything. Yeah. Awesome, so one more question from Sarah. She says, in terms of conservation efforts, how can you convince people of the importance of mantas? Um, like, what is their role in the ocean that would have such a big impact if they disappeared? Well, I think, uh, I always think about this, like, uh, I cannot imagine an ocean without manta rays, right? Like every species have a have a role in the planet right uh, specifically with the mantas it can be maybe the a plankton consumption you know like in general how they play a role in the ecology you know in general as part of the ecosystem so affecting their populations can affect other species right that uh, that 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 can be the ultimate uh, damage without mantas in the oceans. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for stopping by today, Karen. Um, thank and, you. And thank you for everyone for uh, joining yeah. in, tuning in today. Nice. Got to send we them over here. here. <laughs> Um, we'll, uh, we'll be back in about, about 45 minutes actually with the, uh, Karen will be giving a talk in Spanish with, uh, Ligia. Um, so we'll be back on in about 45 minutes or so. Thanks for everyone that tuned in today. Tomorrow we're back at 10 a.m. the same time. I'll be giving a talk on, um, ecotourism and conservation and this kind of projects that are working on in Baja. Um, we talk a bit about, uh, mobulas and everything like that in there and how we're working to try and protect them here in Baja. Um, so look forward to seeing everyone tomorrow. Have a wonderful night and we'll see you later. Thanks again, Karen. Adios. Thank you. Adios. Take care. Bye, everybody. <laughs>